um, DiscoPy monoidal categories in Python um, by Alexis Toomey. Hey, hello. Please go ahead. For the intro. Um, so let me share my screen. Fairly quiet. Can you get slightly closer to your mic? Yep. Yeah. Is that better? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Perfect. So, um, yeah, today I'll be presenting uh, DiscoPy, uh, which is a um, a uh, Python library that we developed uh, with Giovanni De Felice and and Bob uh, helping out not for the code but for the, for the theory behind. So um, let's begin. So I'll um, to give a quick outline for the talk. I'll start with um, some in, intuitive um, answer to the question of what is a diagram, and then some more formal answers to that question and. Then we'll go through essentially the theory that's backing up the Python library. And I'll try and go quickly over the theory so that we can go into the demo. So first we'll get into categories, free categories uh, and functors and how we implement them in Python. Then pre-monoidal categories and how we draw and read diagrams. And then we'll look at how to get from pre-monoidal to monoidal categories with interchanges and normal forms for diagrams. And finally, I'll mention applications. Uh, so the main applications being natural language, grammar, and quantum circuits. So what is a diagram? So intuitively, a diagram is a way of describing systems and processes. And you can take it as an intuitive syntax for describing uh, processes like a cooking recipe or like a quantum protocol. and well, um, essentially you don't necessarily need to know the maths behind it to use them. And that's the approach that, for example, Bob took in his uh, Picturing Quantum Processes book, where essentially you don't need to know how diagrams are defined, you just use them and they're really intuitive. So now how do you define them formally? Well, the first answer, uh, first algebraic answer, is that a, a diagram is a morphism in uh, the free monoidal category generated by some signature. So we have a signature sigma, which has a bunch of arrows, sigma one, a bunch of objects, sigma zero, and each arrow has a domain and a codomain, which are given by strings of objects. So the, the star here denotes the, the free monoid. So that's one answer. And essentially what it means in practice is that a string diagram can be defined as a term generated by tensor, composition, identities, quotiented by the laws of monoidal categories. So that's the easiest answer to give in a way and it's um, a bit of a pain to work with so what's nice is that it also corresponds to a geometric definition where a string diagram is a 1d cell complex embedded in a plane um, and labeled with this um, this signature so essentially it means we have a bunch of nodes and we have a bunch of edges connecting them and this is embedded in the plane and it's labeled with the boxes and the, the object of our signature. So the definition that we'll use in order to implement string diagrams is the combinatorial definition. So a string diagram equivalently is given by a domain and a codomain, which are, um, which are strings of objects, a list of boxes in, um, in the arrows of our signature, and a list of offsets. So I'll define offsets in a minute. And essentially that's the minimum data that we need in order to define a string diagram ex explicitly and to store it in, in terms of a, a data structure in Python. And then we need to take care of a quotient. We need to equate diagrams when they are related by interchanges. So let's get first to three categories and functors and how they're implemented in Python. So just to fix some notation, uh, if we have a simple signature, so something that is a list, a set of arrows, a set of objects, and a pair of maps uh, that go from uh, the arrows to the objects, so the domain and the codomain, well, the free category has uh, sigma zero as objects, and its arrows are given by lists, well, essentially by paths. So by lists such that the domain of each, um, of each arrow is equal to the codomain of the previous one. And now we can define identity arrows as empty list and composition by list concatenation. And essentially we get all the axioms of categories from the associativity and 
unitality of the, the free monoid of lists. So now um, a way of um, characterizing this um, free category uh, by its universal property is to say that when we have a functor that goes from free category into any category D, it's uniquely defined by a morphism of signature from sigma to the underlying signature of this category. So what it means is that for a functor uh, from the free category to D, we only need to define the image of each generator in sigma. And why is that important to us is it, it's a finite amount of data. So this functor gives the image an, an infinite, uh, potentially infinite set of, of paths, but it's only defined by its image on, on a signature, which can be finite. So how do we implement this in Python? Well, we've got a bunch of classes. We've got objects, which are only required to have a name, and two objects are equal if they have the same name. We have arrows, which have a domain domain and a codomain being objects and a list of boxes. And what is a box? Well, it has a name as well and it only has a domain and a codomain. So in order to define an arrow of a category of a category in this copy, you only need to first define a bunch of boxes and then compose them to give an arrow. And now if you want to define a functor, it's enough to give me ob and r, so two Python dictionaries which map objects to objects and arrows to arrows. So in the default case, you just look at free functors, so functors from a free category to a free category, and that means that the mapping ob goes from ob object to ob, and arrow goes from box to, to arrow. Uh, but in general, you can define the codomain of your function functor to be any category implemented in Python. And that's what those two extra arguments of factory and our factory do for you, is they allow you to define any, um, any codomain for your functor. So it could be the category of Python functions, for example. Uh, so um, let's go to the next step where now we want to get into diagrams per se, and not only arrows in a category, but arrows in a monoidal category. And as a middle step, we use pre-monoidal categories. So the, the first reason is that a pre, the free pre-monoidal category is easy to define as a free category. And the second reason is we can get monoidal categories, so proper string diagrams as a quotient of this pre-monoidal category as in a second step. So essentially we start by defining a pre-monoidal category as a category with a unito and associative functor which goes from C box C to C. And this box is called the funny monoidal product. And essentially it's the only other um, closed monoidal structure in CAT apart from the Cartesian product. And it's defined as a push out where you take the discrete categories of objects, C0 and D0, you inject them into the left and the right hand side and you the push out gives you this funny monoidal product. And essentially what it means is it's also called a one and a half category uh, because it's a two category without interchanges. So um, let's look at what the free pre-monoidal category looks like. Well, if we're given a signature, a monoidal signature this time, which goes from sigma one to strings of sigma zero, um, the free pre-monoidal category is a free category where the signature is given by the layers. So what is a layer? It's given by um, a wire on the left, U, and a wire on the right, V, together with a box in the middle, this F. So now we take this to be a generator in a simple signature, and now we define a diagram to be an arrow of this free category. So a pre-monoidal diagram is just a list of layers. So now it's sufficient in order to define an arrow in this free pre-monoidal category, it's sufficient to give me the, the domain of the diagram and to give me the list of boxes in that diagram. And for each box, the number of wires pass to its left. So just the length of this U here. And that's the data that we're gonna use in order to define um, pre-monoidal diagrams. So now, 
to define the free monoidal category, um, we take this free pre monoidal category and we quotient it uh, with the interchanger relation, which says that whenever we have um, two boxes in our diagram which are not connected, so there's this wire V passing in the middle, we can interchange them and we can um, essentially yeah, go from um, the left, the right hand side of of this relation and well, what's nice is it, it completely characterizes the monoid the free monoidal category and the associated world problem so given two diagrams are they equal up to interchanger is decidable in polynomial time so that's the data structure that we're going to use for this copy and it underlies all of the the rest of the library so essentially um we've got a Python implementation of this world problem. So we can take that, we can define diagrams in Python and we can check for equality between diagrams. Mm. Just as a side note, um, if you stay with pre monoidal categories, so you, you don't the interchanger, what can be useful for is to model side effects. So the idea is if this box f has a side effect then performing it before or after f prime is going to have different uh, semantics and essentially that's what you'd get if you implemented a category of python functions with side effects well the diagram on the left wouldn't necessarily be equal to the one on the right so um yeah i guess um the state monad essentially the, the state monad um isn't commutative and its scarcely category is um, monoidal, uh, pre monoidal category. So um, let's close this side note. And now we get to applications. So essentially, the name of this copy comes from distributional compositional Python and it was meant as an implementation of the DiscoCat framework of Bob and Manoush and, and others. And the idea is you can define the diagrams for grammatical reduction. So this Alice loves Bob on top, and you can define um, a category, a monoidal category of uh, matrices using NumPy. And now you can interpret this grammatical reduction as a linear map, the same way as we've seen in the previous talk, where essentially now you can compute the semantics for a grammatical sentence by just applying a functor to it, replacing every noun by a vector, replacing um, a verb by a matrix, and you get, um, you, you get, by applying a functor, you get the meaning of the sentence. And the second application that we implemented was um, quantum circuits. So quantum circuits are another example of string diagrams. And well, where the generators are, well, we decided to pick uh, bras and cats as gen generators and also to have scalars around. Uh, so this square root two, for example, and now our usual quantum gates will be generators. So this H, which goes from one to one qubit or this CX, which goes from two to two. Um, so we've got this, um, this simple category or this free category of quantum circuits. And we've got, um, we've got a translation which essentially um, uses the PyTicket library from CQC and can translate back and forth between this diagram representation and the underlying representation of Ticket so that you can actually draw your diagram and then implement it uh, and execute it on some quantum hardware. So um, that's what we've done and that'll be the topic of, um, of another talk on uh, Friday. Uh, so essentially th this library was first meant as uh, an implementation of quantum natural language processing and essentially the idea was you take the diagram on the top which is a grammatical sentence you apply a functor to it and you get the diagram on the bottom which is a quantum circuit that evaluates the meaning for that sentence so i think we're done with the theory so let's go to some demo time so uh, let's look at the the repo so it's all on github and it's all uh, open source so you can fork it and you can modify it and you can uh, use it for whatever purposes uh now um it's got 
some documentation and some tests so you can actually trust that it's doing what it should do. And well, it comes with a bunch of notebooks that uh, show the features of this copy uh, and we're adding more and more every day. So let's have, um, let's have a look at maybe one uh, first simple notebook, which um, we inspired ourselves from uh, Pavel Soboshinsky's uh, great blog where he takes uh, cooking recipes uh, as diagrams and he gives the, the recipe for uh, crema di mascarpone. So let's look at the syntax for this copy. Maybe I can zoom in even more. So you start by importing types, box, and identity from this copy. And now you can define a bunch of types. So egg, white, and yolk are all types. Sugar and mascarpone are types as well. And well, you need a type for each uh, step in the middle of the process. So we need a yolky paste and a thick paste as part of our diagram as well. And we get this uh, crema de mascarpone type, which will be the output of our cooking process. Now, you can define a bunch of boxes like crack, which go, takes an egg and gives you white uh, tensored with yolk and a couple of other steps. And now you can define your recipe as well crack tensored with an identity of sugar and mascarpone on the right. Then you whisk, you eat, you stir, you fold, and you get the recipe for crema di mascarpone. So that's the recipe with one egg. What if we want the recipe for two eggs? Well, we can define a functor that sends one egg to two eggs and that sends crack to a diagram for cracking two eggs. So what does this look like? Well, you, you can define a, a box for merge and a box for swap. So you notice here we're not doing symmetric monoidal categories, but you can define the, the symmetry as a regular box in uh, this copy. And now cracking two eggs means you crack, you crack the other egg, you swap the white and the yolk, and then you merge them. So now we've got a box that goes from two eggs to white and yolk. And now if you define a functor which takes uh, an egg and outputs two eggs, uh, or just does nothing, and you take a uh, crack to crack two eggs or you do nothing to the other, you do the identity to the other uh, generators. What you get is a functor which is gonna send our recipe with one egg to a recipe with two eggs. So we've just replaced the box for crack by the box, the diagram for cracking two eggs and we get a, a larger recipe. So that's the, the full blown recipe for crema di mascarpone and then you can draw a larger recipe for tiramisu uh, using this one. And now um, let's get to something maybe uh, a little bit more exciting as a, another, um, another application that we want to use. So I, I didn't mention too much the, the algorithms backing up this copy, but the, the one that took the most work was the drawing algorithm, uh, which takes the combinatorial description and actually draws the diagram on the plane because there's a lot of choices to make. And an interesting application that we want to work on, and I'll finish with that, is uh, going the other way around of how do you go from a picture of a diagram to its combinatorial description in terms of a list of boxes and a list of offsets for each box. Well, um, the, um, for now, we only have it as a very basic prototype. So I'll show, um, I'll show the notebook for that. So the idea is we, we're gonna start by uh, importing everything from this copy and defining a, a fancy diagram. So this, uh, this spiral here and uh, morphism with a bunch of legs on the left. We draw it and now we just save it as an image. So we've got this PNG, uh, just an image for the diagram. And it's as simple as it can get in the sense that there's no labels, there's uh, no noise, but, and we've marked all the, the boxes of our diagram in red. And now the idea is we're gonna go from this um, image to the combinatorial description and the way we do this is we first turn it into an array with uh, red, green, and blue. Now, from this, we can compute the connected components for the boxes. So we've spotted where the boxes in our diagram. We get the connected components, so the, the nine boxes that are part of the diagram. And now we only need to compute the connected component for the wires. And for each wire, where does it start? Where does it end? And from this, we can reconstruct the diagram that we started with. So I skipped through the code because I'm almost done, but from the connectivity of for each wire, where does it start, where does it end? 
what you can get is the diagram that we started with recovered um, in terms of we can now compute the formula for the diagram from its image. So the next step will just be to implement a bunch of, a bunch of machine learning that takes uh, the picture of the board and forget the details so that you can just compute its connectivity and now you can take a picture of the board and just well implement it on a quantum computer directly. So um, I think that'd be all for me. Thank you very much. So yes, that's, that last thing looked very exciting. Um, and also all your, all your um, examples based on recipes have made me slightly hungry given that it's lunchtime. But <laughs> um, uh, so Fabrizio is uh, raising a hand, uh, please go ahead. Um, yeah, hey Alexis, um, you mentioned that uh, you have to make some questions from uh, pre-monodal categories to uh, monodal categories. So I was curious to know how you implement them in Python. Um, so for now, um, the quotient is just implemented with a normal form method, which takes the diagram and outputs its normal form. And um, so to be completely honest, it doesn't work in all the cases. So for example, if you've got a, an Ekman-Hilton diagram, it's just gonna turn around forever. And it works on boundary connected diagrams for now. But the algorithm in general, um, for general diagrams, so even for the ekman helton case, uh, works in polynomial time. We just haven't implemented it yet because we didn't need it. But essentially, the, the way we implemented this quotient is if you want to check proper equality of two diagrams, you turn them into normal form, you check equality of normal forms. Okay, so the algorithm to put things in normal forms is polynomial. That's uh, interesting. I, um, I yeah, so it's polynomial. This, the naive one is uh, at worst cubic time for connected diagrams. So for example, this spiral is the worst case. Uh, it takes cubic time to just unwrap the whole spiral around itself. Um, but um, the algorithm for computing equality of diagrams in general, so not necessarily connected, is uh, polynomial time as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks, um, and Alex has got his hand up as well. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is very cool. Um, my, my question is about this last thing that you showed. Um, mm -hmm. And I suspect I know the answer because you were talking about machine learning as future work. Uh, but um, how crappy of an input can this cope with? Uh, does a little smudge on the paper make an extra box? Does a sort of broken line make a make a break in the wire this sort of stuff <laughs> so for now it's basically pure geometry so it uh, it assumes that the input is perfect there's no like noise wherever there's no um there's no handwriting there's no like uh deform i mean yeah it assumes the input is perfect i mentioned machine learning because essentially a step to the next step to make this a uh, useful tool would be to train a machine learning algorithm to remove noise from the picture of the board and turn it into something where there's only the black for the wires and the red for the boxes. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe if you train it enough, um, it should work all right on pictures of the board uh, uh, if you give it enough training data. Cool. But I think you can also start uh, working on it with just uh, synthetic data in the sense that um, if you have a, a bunch of um, formulae for diagrams you can try uh, printing it uh, in this way and then printing it with a bunch of uh, artificial noise on top and trying to, to train the machine from that to begin with. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess collecting a lot of data of diagrams with their formulae would be a, a, nice, um, a nice step. Um, I guess there's maybe things you could take off the shelf to, to help as kind of a pre-pass to do some sort of shape recognition to turn your hand-drawn boxes into these very nice, perfect little red blobs and so on. Yeah, I mean, I guess the point with machine learning is you don't want to come up with the code for that by hand. Uh, and you just want the machine to, to learn that mapping. Um, I'm guessing that if you write the algorithm, so the, um, ge the geometric part of the algorithm uh, good enough, it should be tolerant to some threshold of noise in a sense you, 
um, you can clip the image so that you remove um, the things that are not red enough or that are not black enough to be a wire. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, um, thank you. Um, I think we're now um, having five minutes of break before the next talk. Um, so yeah, uh, everyone uh, remember to take your hands down after your question, um, unless you have any more questions, just so we don't get confused. And um, yes, thank you very much again.